so simple, you're something that nobody knows. Yeah, the eyes are as big as a bubble of toes. On the feet of a queen of the hearts of the cards. And the feet are all covered with tar balls and scars. It's a common or something that nobody knows. Yeah, the beauty will find her wherever she goes. Up the head and the back of the house in the wood. She loved me forever, I know she could. She'll do it again when you move like a jellyfish with a no me nothing. You go with the flow, you don't stop. Move like a jellyfish, rhythm is nothing. You go with the flow, you don't stop. It's mm. coming to something that nobody knows. And the beauty will follow wherever she goes. Up the hill in the back of a house in the woods. She loved me forever, I know. She loved that guy. La da 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 la da 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 la da 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 da. You would only listen, you might just realize what you're missing. You're missing me. You would only listen, you might just realize what you're missing. You're missing me. Something that nobody knows, and the eyes are as big as a bubbly toes, and the feet of a queen of the hearts of the cow, feet of a festival with all bones, and like that, 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 song called Plush.
Well, hello there, everyone. Glad you could make it today. Happy Wednesday. Happy last day of class. If that's not exciting, I don't know what is. Just going to wait a couple minutes to see if we have any stragglers coming in. We have not a lot of people here. So give a few minutes. Um, any underlying questions or anything you want to discuss before we get going? Okay, well, um, so today what we're going to do, um, well, let me start off by saying, um, hopefully you guys saw the updated announcement with the modified outline. Um, it's the outline that was posted in week 15, just tweaked a little bit. Um, some stuff taken out um, and some little notes put in there. Um, but we weren't going to reinvent the wheel and create something brand new when we already have something. So um, it's just condensed a little bit. I think it went from 14 pages to 11. So there's that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> There was also um, a breakdown percentage wise of questions, which we haven't done in the past. Um, I want to make sure that you guys understand that it is like a rough estimate because certain questions could fit in more than one category. It could be GI and cardiac, or you know, maybe we talked about PCAs in GI. Well, it's not a GI thing, but that's where it fit into even though it's maybe a, a cardiac surgery, who knows? But um, so everything's pretty approximate. You can see that the weeks that we spent longer times on have bigger chunks because there was more to it. Um, but however you go about it is gonna be up to you. I think your key to studying for this exam is going to be able to understand the nursing process and its components for diseases. So if I have COPD, what is it? What assessments and expected findings would you expect? Can you recognize those? How do we diagnose it? What diagnostics are done? What testings are done for it? And then putting that plan into place. What interventions? What teachings? What medications? If you guys can understand that concept for the disease, you're doing good. So, um, <clears throat> so then, for the review, the way that these are run is basically I go through the key concepts, and if there are questions, you got to open your mouth. I'm not going to go through step by step by step by step because we did that already for 14 weeks with content. So if there's something you're not clear about, this is your time so we can address questions and, and answer them and go through there. So like if there's not a question on ABGs, I'm not going to spend a couple minutes talking about it because we feel good. But if you want to know something, let's talk about it. Does that make sense? So it's, it's we'll make good use of your time because I know time is valuable this week. It's kind of what it's getting down to. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. In the previous exams, you said you've had a hard time uploading pictures. Is that the same with the final? Yep, there are no pictures on this on this exam. Oh. Thank so you. with the yep, with the EKGs. It's the same kind of questions where you have to be able to identify based off of a description or if we give you the rhythm, what are you going to do about it? And we made a really nice chart in class that had a picture, causes, treatments, use that as a study guide. That's why we did that. That's really what's going to help you with those, um, with, the, with, the, with EKG strips. Well, rhythms. <clears throat> um, any other questions? Can you go over like, I think a lot of us missed the questions on like the chest tubes on the first um, exam. Just kind of like I got the titling and bubbling stuff, but it was just the location and understanding like the actual drainage system. Cause I knew like bubbling was bad, but it was like, just, I don't know if it was the wording or what, but that kind of confused me. Absolutely. 
Um, so looking at the key concepts, do we have any questions about the diagnostics? Bronchoscopies, do you feel good about bronchs? Safety concerns, indications. Where's my chat? Okay. Okay. Same thing with thoracentesis, understanding indications, what's done, safety considerations, potential complications. All right. So then we can dive into the chest tubes. Um, let me see here. That's not the right thing. So what are the components of a chest tube? The compartments. What? Oh, I don't know exactly the compartments, but I know that it's kind of used for drainage. Like you can have blood. Um, and I don't know why chest tubes are so confusing to me because I feel like they shouldn't be. <laughs> but I just know that you can use it for, is it cardiac tamponade? Can you use it for that? If there's fluid in that. Mm -hmm. And then so chest, you use it for the pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. Either attention or fluid. So it's either gas or fluid that we're going to remove from the pericardium, um, from the pleural space. So chest tubes are typically set to water seal. They can be set to suction, like a NG tube could. But water seal means it's connected to the person and then it just goes to the container. Sterile water gets put into the container in the OR. You never see it, but that's the water that we watch that fluctuates. That's water. That's what water seal means. Um, <clears throat> the water seal allows air to exit in and out, okay, because it's negative pressure. So that's what's going to help reinflate the lung and allow things to move, but it's going to stop air from getting in. So it allows for it to air to get out but air can't get back in. That's what the water does in that water seal. So the thing that tripped you guys up on the exam, and I'm gonna use broad terms, and I mean all 230 of you that took the exam. The thing that um, people struggled with was recognizing keywords, like um, when we're talking about bubbling. So slight bubbling, that's normal. There's going to be some bubbling in there. But frequent or even intermittent bubbling can be an issue, okay? If there's bubbling in the water seal, we have an air leak, okay? So we will see some bubbles, though, when the patient exhales or coughs. So that's why you have to look for words like intermittent or frequent. frequent. Continuous bubbling in that water seal means that we have a really big air leak between the patient and the drain. So we wanna to check to see if it's disconnected, if it became like pulled out a little bit or if it's loose, maybe the seal that connects to it is, is not on there properly and we wanna assess the patient. If it's a small air leak, we monitor, we document, but it doesn't need immediate intervention, okay? But if it's a big air leak, we need to do something. The water in this water seal is going to rise and fall. That's that titling. And that is going to start to go away as if it's a pneumothorax, um, that'll start to go away as the pneumothorax like reinflates. If all of a sudden we have no titling, no movement of that water, we probably have a kink somewhere. So we'd want to check the tubing for kinks or it basically kinks or a blockage. Maybe there's a big old fat clot or something. So the key to chest tube questions is what is the adjective? Okay, is it frequent? Is it intermittent? Is it continuous? What about, what about what? regular? regular? like regular bubbling? Yeah, regular yeah. bubbling. Regular bubbling would probably be more of a, be on line with continuous. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So some bubbling is normal. A Little bit of bubbling is normal. We don't do anything. 
intermittent, let's check the patient. Continuous or frequent, we have to look for an air leak. So no matter what with the bubbling, that indicates it's an air leak. But the more bubbling there is, the bigger the leak there is, if that makes sense. Let's talk crepitus with chest tubes, because that was another issue that you guys had. So first and foremost, what is crepitus? The rice crispy on the skin. <laughs> yeah, so it's air trapped in that subcutaneous tissue. Trick question, is crepitus a normal finding with chest tubes? Well, you yeah. said it's a trick yes. question, so, but yes? Yes and no. So this is going to be dependent on the situation. At the insertion site, where the chest tube goes in, there will be some crepitus upon first insertion. But if it all of a sudden, it's like all the way over here, like hours later, that's not normal. That needs to be reported. So anytime we're inserting something big into a bigger area, like air can get in. Okay, so that crepitus at the insertion site is a normal finding, it will go away. But if it's more massive and widespread or develops day after the chest tube's been inserted, then that's something we want to report. So that's why I say it's a trick question. Because yes and no. Um, what equipment needs to be at the bedside with chest tubes? An ambu bag. An ambu bag, okay. Sterile water. Sterile water. I like a section on the wall. Okay. Clamps. What else? Clamps. One more thing. Gauze or dressing? We need the occlusive dressing, so a petrolatum type dressing. You come into your patient's room and the chest tube is laying on the bed. The tube, you can see the eyelets of the tube on the bed. What do you do? What is your priority action? To cover the open wound with the gauze. Okay. So the gauze should be placed over the chest tube insertion point, how? Is this the three, like where you tape three of the sides so that the air can escape, but it won't go back in? Yes. So it needs to be taped down on three sides. So if this is my gauze, three sides means I put a piece of tape on the top, on the side, on the bottom. One side needs to be left open. It truly doesn't matter what three sides have tape on it. It's your preference. Some people will do top in the sides and leave the bottom open. It doesn't matter. Three sides. Okay. So you cover that. Now what do you do? Or what else do you need to do? Put the tube in the sterile water. Put this tube in the sterile water. What else? Are you going to monitor the patient's breathing? You better assess them. They just had their chest tube taken out accidentally. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take a look at them. How are they doing? How are they breathing? After all that, we notify the provider. And I know that sounds backwards because like, oh, their chest tube came out. We should let them know. We have to cover the hole first. That's the priority. Okay. We can call for help or have somebody else do that. 80% of the time when notify the provider is in the answer, it's not always correct. It's a, it's a distractor. What's more important, taking the time and leaving an open wound in a chest cavity, open to go call the doctor or the NP, or covering it and then going to call them? Yes, we do want to do that, but that's a chest wound. 
It really is. So we got to get that taken care of first. So yep, we cover it. We're going to be assessing them. And then we let them know what's going on. It may or may not go back in. If they're doing well and they're oxygenating well and there's no issues with bleeding or if it was a pneumo clap thing, it might stay out. Or if it's not, then they're going to put it back in. So if they had the chest tube, what kind of assessments would you be doing on them? Let's say it's still in place. It's not even out. What are your priorities? What are you concerned about? What are you looking for? Watching for bleeding, hemorrhaging, watching for signs of infection. And if they're still filling up the chest tube, like how much fluid is in the chest tube? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And true, and also keep in mind, it might not just be blood. It could just be air. There might be no output in a chest tube because its sole purpose is for air release, for gas to get out. So we really do see them most often with blood, but not always. So, okay, so we're gonna look for infection. We do like a respiratory assessment, like respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and work of breathing. Okay, we're gonna listen to those lung sounds. What's an indication this is kind of jumping back to pneumothoraxes, which we were going to get to in a minute, but we'll talk about them quickly. What physical finding would we see that a tension pneumo is present if we were doing our assessment on them? The trachea is deviated. Yep, so with the tension pneumo, that trachea is going to shift to the unaffected side. So if my right lung is collapsed, my trachea would be all the way over to the left and vice versa. Whereas if it's like an open wound, it's going to deviate to the side that the wound is on. Okay. Um, let's see. Sorry, I have a question. Also, it's a little loud. I don't know if you can hear it. I have people fixing my water heater, but um, um, so if you find a patient that has like a deviated trachea, this seems like a stupid question now that I'm thinking about it, but um, if there was like a question that said like how would you know that the chest tube is like not properly placed or something like that would it a trach a deviated trachea be a finding for that do you know what i mean um so the deviated trachea simply means that we have tension in the cavity so that air is building up in that pleural space and it's pushing out so that's what causes the trachea to deviate so if they already have a chest tube in and I'm seeing the deviated trachea, that's an indication that the chest tube is either occluded or it's not in place. Maybe it got dislodged a little bit. So we shouldn't see that un until um, we shouldn't see that. If it's a brand new patient, they don't even have a chest tube in, seeing that finding can be an indication like, let me listen to that side because I bet you I have no lung sounds on the the opposite side. So that's more of like a warning sign that something isn't right. So if you have one, if it's deviated with the chest tube, that chest tube is not working. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so complications of chest tubes, infection, that's a big one. What else do you think is a potential complication with chest tubes? You got a tube shoved into the intercostal space of a patient. Pain? You think? Thank you. I'm like, do you think this feels good? <laughs> so pain, we have to make sure that we're addressing pain. If you're having a lot of pain, with breathing, are you likely to take deep breaths? 
What happens if we don't take deep breaths? Pneumonia. Atelectasis. Atelectasis, which can lead to pneumonia. So we want to make sure that we are controlling pain, that they're using their incentive spirometer to prevent complications like atelectasis and pneumonia. So pain medications, muscle relaxers, benzos, anything to help with the pain at the insertion site if they're having it. They already, are, they already have a respiratory issue with whatever pneumo they have. Um, so we wanna prevent other stuff from happening too and promote air exchange, so. What other questions about chest tubes? Uh, how do we feel about CPAP and BiPAP and ventilators? Understand indications, usage, when you would see one over another, potential complications. CPAP and BiPAP, typically their potential complications is not wearing it, but what could go wrong on a ventilator? Hyperoxygenation. Pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So how do we prevent those things? Positioning, PPIs, oral care. Questions on incentive spirometers or trachs? What instructions would you give somebody who has an incentive spirometer? Um, you're gonna suck in air rather than exhale and do it at least 10 times an hour or when you're watching TV and you're awake, do it during the commercials. You wanna hold that breath in, right? Yeah. You're taking it in, you wanna hold it for three seconds. And then release. Yeah, you wanna watch the little thing fluctuate to like the, the one on the side. The biggest thing people screw up with incentive spirometry is sucking or blowing. It's a straw. If you look at it at the heart of the matter, it's a straw. It looks like a, a crinkly straw, like when you pull it out. So that's, just remember that. For whatever reason, students have a hard time with remembering that, that it's a straw, so. All right then. I'm gonna cruise along till you say stop. Pneumonia, what kind of a no pneumonia do we have? Hospital acquired pneumonia. Okay, which would be an example? What would be an example of hospital acquired pneumonia? Like aspiration and pneumonia? So, aspiration could be, but it could also be happen in the community because somebody could aspirate when they're at home. So, it's kind of like in its own little bubble. But we have aspiration pneumonia, we have hospital acquired, and then we have community acquired. So, those are, we really talked about community and hospital. Hospital happens in the hospital. It's a result of being in the hospital, treatments in the hospital. Ventilator acquired pneumonia is an example of an HCAP. Being in the hospital for more than two days and developing pneumonia, that's an example of HCAP. Community acquired, anything that happens outside of the hospital or like right before they got in. Um, so with pneumonia, understanding causes, treatments, diagnostics, meds, teachings. How do we feel about asthma?
some of these diseases I know you guys have had since like day one of nursing school. So you feel a little bit more confident about some of rather than others, and that's totally fine. So asthma, um, let's discuss medications, asthma meds, because asthma meds and COPD meds can be very similar. What would I want to know about the medications to asthma meds? There's long lasting and short acting. And okay. long lasting are medications that you're always taking kind of on a daily basis, while the short acting are for um, acute exacerbations, like, or whatever that word is, where you're feeling the asthma attack come on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if I have a long acting and a short acting inhaler, and I take them every day, which should I use first? Short. Short. And how come? Because it opens up your airway. It's a bronchodilator. So it'll pr promote, promote, I can't talk, promote more absorption of the lava. Um, long acting bronchodilators, inhaled corticosteroids, what do we need? What should we make sure we do afterwards? Brush our teeth. Yeah, rinse that mouth out, especially with the inhaled corticosteroids because you're at high risk of developing thrush. Um, let's see. Patient comes in having an asthma attack. What's your primary, what's the first thing you're gonna do first? They're walking in, they can't breathe. First and step, well, let me back that up. What is an asthma attack? How do they look? How do they present as? What signs and symptoms would you see? Wheezing. Definitely the wheezing, 100%. I'm sorry? Retractions. Yep. Shortness of breath. Most definitely. Um, so we'll talk about those findings. The wheezing is the hallmark sign of an asthma attack. The air cannot move through the alveoli. Um, if we are having retractions, that is a significant sign of respiratory distress. So we should not be able to see them. The other thing that we shouldn't be able to see, we see it more with kids, are the intercostal retractions. So the skin in between the ribs will sink into, and you see like divots between all the ribs. It's harder to see on adults because we have more fat than kids. So we typically do see it more with the, with the children than we do adults, but we can. Um, and use of accessory muscles. So you can see their, like, their diaphragm and stuff helping to work with the breathing. Those are all signs of respiratory distress. All right, so they're wheezing. I can't breathe. Now what? Would you wanna get a nebulizer to open up the airway? Praise Jesus, yes we do. Get the meds on them, okay? We need to get those meds on them. Everything else will come secondary. They cannot breathe. Their airways are like this. We need to open up those airways. That's our priority. That's ABCs right there. Um, <clears throat> do, 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 do. What diagnostics are done with asthma? Pulmonary function. meter. Okay, so PFTs. We'll definitely get those at some point. What else? ABGs. 100%. We need to see what's going on. What are they retaining? What's their oxygen level? What's happening? So ABGs, without a doubt. Um, ABGs, PFTs, they'll get a chest x-ray. 
and they may or may not get a sputum culture too to rule out an infection, infectious cause of what's going on as well. Um, so we wanna make sure that with these asthma attacks, we're getting them the medications, they're staying in an upright position to help lung expansion, keeping them calm. During asthma attacks and COPD issues, they're very anxious and rightfully so. They can't, they can't move air, they can't breathe. So they can tend to stress out, which puts the body into an increased stress state, which can lead to other issues. Um, what, no, that's not a good question. Never mind. Um, during severe asthma attacks, what are your priorities? Maintaining an airway. Yeah. So if somebody is having, you know, a life threatening asthma attack, prepare for intubation. Remember with status asthmaticus, we would, um, wheezing would be present obviously, because they're having an, uh, an asthma attack. But when the wheezing stops, that means they're close to respiratory failure. So something we have to watch out for. Um, so continuous nebulizers. We also anticipate IV magnesium. Magnesium is a um, relaxer. So it will help smooth everything out um, and allow for air, air to be exchanged. Um, and then we prepare for immediate intubation. Get IV access going, administer medications. Um, what are some triggers of asthma? Allergies. Exercise. Oh yeah. Cold air. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong pipe. Poor air quality in general. So air pollutants, odors. Some people are so sensitive to perfumes or soaps. It can trigger an asthma attack in other people. Um, the seasonal stuff that we talked about, outdoor pollutants, um, so in the event that they have asthma, what education would you want to make sure that they understand? Avoid their own triggers. Okay. How to properly use their medication. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Remember, lavas and inhaled corticosteroids cannot be used in an acute attack. It will kill them, potentially. So and, um, that's one thing. Do they understand their regimen? And do they know how to administer their inhalers properly? Okay. Um, and if they smoke, don't smoke. And not to be around smoke or secondhand smoke. All right, good, good, good. Feeling good about asthma? Okay, how about COPD? So what would be, let's start with teaching. What would be an indication that teaching has been effective with your COPD patient? Would it be that their symptoms are not as bad? Yeah. Or they verbalize things appropriately. So what would what are things that you would want to teach your COPD ears? I guess is what I'm getting at. <laughs> if they're smoking to stop smoking. Yep. Drink plenty of water to make the secretions less thick. 
Absolutely, two to three liters of day a day, if not contraindicated, to help with the thinning of secretions. Remember, fluids don't, fluids thin secretions, they don't help you get them out, okay? If you want to expectorate the secretions, you have to cough or take like a mucolytic, which they're often on, like a mucinex to help get them out, but the water helps thin them as part of that process. High calorie diet and resting. Yeah, why do we want a high calorie diet? Because it's exhausting for them. <laughs> they are working, it takes a lot of energy to breathe, so they need the calories. 100% high protein calories. What physical findings would you anticipate with the COPD or? Clubbing of the nails. Okay. Barrel chest. Enlarged neck. How do they breathe? The tripod. Yeah, a lot of times they put themselves in that tripod positioning and they do pursed lipped breathing. Pursed lipped breathing allows for us to control the exhale. So it's something that we definitely want them to do, help blow off that CO2. I have a COPD patient and I do an assessment on them and their pulse ox is 92%. What are your thoughts? Well, usually, isn't it COPD where sometimes their oxygen stats will be lower? So don't increase the oxygen, just kind of leave it usually. We expect them to tr start trending down lower depending on the severity of the COPD. So giving them oxygen can take away their respiratory drive cause them to hold on to the oxygen and then retain a whole bunch of CO2. So when we are giving oxygen to COPD ears, we have to be very careful, not give more than we need. And there has to be a true indication for it. Some COPD ears, they are, they are living in the eighties, like pulse ox, not the decade. Um, they're like 88% and they're totally fine. They're walky, they're talky. There's no respiratory distress. You just gotta keep an eye on them. You or I though, without COPD, if we're at 88%, we're gonna, we're gonna sit you up, encourage some deep breathing, cough and deep breathing. And if that doesn't work, put a little O2 on you. But COPD ears, we have to be careful with. Um, <clears throat> potential complications of COPD. Don't overthink it, but ABCs, potential complications, death, intubation. Um, okay. It could lead to right sided heart failure, too, right? Yes, 100%. I'm gonna cruise right along then. TB, concerns about TB. Who need, anybody need clarification on TB? I didn't get any requests in that thing, so the survey. All right, how do we feel about PEs? What treatments are available for somebody with a PE? this be like coagulation therapy okay yep so which kind what 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 specifically is it heparin 
Potentially. What else do we have? PPA. Okay. Depending on where the clot is. Do I have an oral med? Do I have an injection? Warfarin, anoxoparin. Yep. And All those can be, yep. All of those can be used to treat a PE. So my question is, is where does a PE come from? A DBT. You know, majority of the times, yes, it's a DBT. It's a clot that started somewhere else in the body and landed in the lungs. So depending on the severity of the clot, how big it is, how it impairs on oxygenation, um, treatments can vary. If my patient is on a heparin drip, what do I need to monitor? Feeding time. Okay. Lab specifically. Which lab specifically? PTT. You have to know. Heparin is your APTT and warfarin is what? Your PTT. Does Stephanie say it? So your prothrombin time slash ionized national ratio, whatever that stands for, I don't even remember, INR. PTINR is for warfarin. Your PTT and your APTT, that's for heparin. That was a big confusion for you guys on that exam. I remember that. So know which labs for which drug. What, what lab for anoxaparin? PTT. PTT? No. We don't use a lab to monitor an oxaparin. We can look at platelets, but that's pretty much it. We don't do any type of monitoring with it. So you don't need to worry about it. If anything, it would be platelets. Trick question. So I have my labs. I'm monitoring my labs. What else am I looking for? Or am I concerned about what am I monitoring? Bleeding. Looking for signs and symptoms of bleeding. So I'm looking for bruising, blood coming out of stuff it's not supposed to, an IV out of their nose, out of their gums. So people on anticoagulants, remember your interventions. Electric razors soft toothbrushes, avoiding dangerous activities. My dad, he is on anticoagulants, um, but he went skiing like a couple weeks ago and he just took like the slightest fall and he had the biggest bruise. And it was crazy because we all, like everyone falls and we don't get that big, huge bruise, but his was huge. So it was kind of scary, but yeah. It is very scary. And if a patient who is on, if they have an unwitnessed fall, like let's say you guys weren't there and they DFO'd, we assume that they hit their head because we're very concerned about bleeding in the brain. So um, yeah, and it's the smallest little like, Thing. I mean, you guys have probably all given subcutaneous heparin shots in the hospital, I'm guessing as part of clinical, and you've seen their belly, like how bruised it gets from a little poke. So it, it can be very, very dangerous. Um, I will say, Angela, yes, because if you don't need it for this, you need it for clinical. So two to three. That's one of those labs that doesn't go away. It's like potassium. You have to know potassium. You have to know your INR. <laughs> What's the range for the PTT? That I don't know. And I'll tell you because my hospital doesn't use PTT. It uses something else to monitor for heparin. Amy, is okay. this, is the PE where they would use the TPA? 
if needed or no, could, was that something else? They could, it, it would be a direct one. It ha they'd have to fit all that criteria. It would truly have to be a pretty big clot for them to do it because their risk of bleeding is so significant. So that is a potential or they can do an embolectomy where they would go in and remove the clot um, as well. But for the most part, they'll do the anticoagulants. It's not gonna break up the clot, but it's gonna make it less sticky so it doesn't get bigger. The TPA would bust up the clot though, if they fit that requirement. And they may not, not many people do, unfortunately. <laughs> because you can't have had any recent surgeries or any recent bleeding. And who are most prone for clots? Our post-op patients. So they wouldn't be a good candidate for it. How do we prevent PEs? SCDs. Ambulation. Bed hose, ambulation, moving, preventative anticoagulants if they're on like subcutaneous heparin during their stay. Um, remember, um, enoxaparin is a weight based medication that we tend to use more for our, our overweight or obese patients because it is weight based, whereas sub Q heparin is not. So if we're using it as a prophylactic measure to prevent a DVT or a PE, then um, an axaparin would be the meta choice. And we'll talk, well, yeah, we'll get to the DVT and stuff as well. Um, okay. Impending doom. If you see the words impending doom on any exam, I'm not saying this one because I sure didn't put it on there, those words exactly. But if you do, I've seen practice questions and done things, impending doom, recognize PE, okay? Um, pneumothoraxes. Any questions left? Excuse me, about pneumothoraxes. Can be air, can be blood, could be pleural fluid, which is a pleural effusion. Treatments for pneumothoraxes? Chest tube. Or? Thoracentesis. Yep. You've seen it on TV. They take a big old needle and they shove it into the intercostal space and it helps with reinflation. So, um, mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Okay. If you guys feel good, I will continue on. Do, 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 do. Pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema. We'll get to that. I, I lied. Pause. I need to stay on track here. Let's go to respiratory failure. Arf and ARDS. Another trick question, which is worse? Uh, acute respiratory failure. So this is a situation thing, but technically ARDS is worse. And I know it's distress. So we're like, oh, that's like not as bad as failure. But acute respiratory failure can happen for any reason. And we can usually treat it. We give them oxygen. We treat the cause. They respond well. With ARDS, acute respiratory distress, it does not matter how much oxygen we are throwing at these patients. They are not responding. The alveoli have collapsed. We have no air movement. These patients need to be intubated and put on PE. We need to force everything through them. That is not always the case with acute respiratory failure. So acute respiratory failure can be really bad. It, they may need to be intubated, but typically we can fix acute respiratory failure. 
Um, so with acute respiratory failure, shortness of breath, cyanosis, some paleness, um, tachycardia, some agitation will be going on. And again, kind of anything can cause it. Infection, trauma, other conditions. With ARDS, they're going to have that shortness of breath, um, but they'll also have pulmonary edema, so they're going to have fluid in the lungs. Um, no matter how much oxygen, they will not be oxygenating appropriately and they'll be confused. So we diagnose with chest x-rays and ABGs. Our goal with these are to prevent death, to get them oxygenating well, um, preventing further injury, further complications. If they're intubated, preventing pneumonia, um, <clears throat> preventing blood sores. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. You say with ours, they'd usually be intubated? Yes. And it has a high mortality rate. Whereas failure, they, they can, I saw a lot of respiratory failure with COVID and it can progress to ARDS without doubt. But even like regular pneumonia can cause respiratory failure. So it's more characterized like by the non-movement of air, they're not oxygenating as well, but we can treat the cause. And when by treating the cause, we can treat the failure. Um, where's my keys? Okay. Questions about OSA? Or anything you don't understand about that? Atelectasis? Prevention? Who's at risk for atelectasis? Is that the white skinny males? Ooh. Well, I'm gonna, not quite, but yes, post-op patients because they're not up and moving. So atelectasis is just laziness of the lungs in all honesty. So if we're not taking good deep breaths, we prevent atelectasis by IS and coughing and deep breathing. Our skinny white males are at high risk for developing a spontaneous pneumothorax. Those 16 year old boys that shoot up a foot and a half in the summer, they're at risk for their lungs collapsing, lung collapsing. Um, what about pleural effusion or pleural edema? Can we go over those two real quick? Absolutely. So <clears throat> pulmonary edema typically occurs when we just have too much fluid in the lungs. Um, the sacs get full of fluid. This is usually due to pneumonia or heart failure. So with plural, uh, pulmonary edema, the alveoli have filled with pulmonary fluid or pleural fluid. Pleural effusion, the sac, the pericardials or the sac around the lungs, the pleural space gets full with fluid and it prevents them from moving. Um, so with both of these, we want to control breathing, keeping them under control, um, but also pulmonary edema can come on very quickly and it's characterized by that pink frothy sputum. And pleural fusion is basically a pneumothorax, but with fluid. So pleural fusion will be outside of the lungs and pleural um, pulmonary edema is gonna be inside. So we'll diurese those patients. Pleural fusion, we're gonna drain.
Okay. Moving on. All right. Well, let's talk about cardiac. So <clears throat> you still need to know your blood frontwards and backwards. Because remember, if I have a valvular issue, I need to know what's behind because that's where the issue is going to lie. Um, a ch chest pain. Chest pain is what? An MI, unless we prove it otherwise. It is a heart attack until we prove it's not. So we treat it that way. If they are complaining of chest pain, your primary intervention is to get them on the monitor. Let's do an EKG. Um, cardiac labs, troponin, BNP, feel good on those. Troponin for MI, BNP for heart failure. Echoes. Are there questions on echoes? Echoes are ultrasounds. They're quick, they're pretty painless. TTE, transthoracic, it's on the outside. They just have to lay there quietly for a few minutes. It's not hours, a few minutes while they look and evaluate the ejection fraction, the function of the heart, the function of the valves. Your TEE, your transesophageal echo, like the tea you drink, has the scope that goes down the throat. So they're gonna get some happy juice, be real chill, really not know what's going on. So that one's more invasive. We just have to be concerned about swallowing afterwards. Very few complications with that. But your TTE is less invasive. So make sure you understand, if you had a question, your patient is preparing to have a transesophageal echo. What, what teaching would you want to provide to your patient? They're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. What potential complications are you looking for? Swallowing issues, respiratory issues, maybe a slight sore throat afterwards. What was the prep again for the TEE? Um, their MPO beforehand. Um, usually the night before, and they get medication when they get down there. So they'll have an IV, they'll get their Versed. And they're quick. These are not all day things. What do we do? I, I kind of answered this, but I'm going to ask it again. What do we use echoes for? So if I'm a patient and I say to you, why do I need this test done? Your best response would be. To look for valvular disorders. Okay, that is one reason, yep. I want to see how well your heart is functioning, how well your pump is pumping. We're looking for any structural issues. Okay. What about stress tests? Talk to me about stress tests. So there can be a pharmacological or non pharmacological stress test. Okay. And they're just seeing how your heart works when it's under stress. So like if it's non-pharmacological, they'll put you on a treadmill and you'll, you'll be running. But then if you have like any pain at all, we're supposed to immediately stop the stress test. Do we restart it? No, no, no. It is and we, is that where we hook them up to telly too? To be able yeah. to watch them? They'll technically already be on telly during this because we're also looking for any type of rhythm changes. So when they're doing either stress tests, they'll be connected to the machine. So if they develop any chest pain, 
or any change in cardiac rhythm, it's done. Or if nothing happens and they reach their target heart rate, then we stop. So they will be connected to it already. We do not restart it for any reason. Once it's done, it's done. So on the non or on the pharmacological stress test, so if we give them a medication and you know they're in pain, do we give them the antidote? Like, is there an antidote on hand or? Don't ask me what it is because I don't know because I don't administer stress tests, but they would they would do interventions to get that out of their system or, or to come back, come back, come back that. Because it truly depends on which type of medication they give them to trigger the stress event, because there's like four or five different ones. But that's a specialty question. Um. Why do we do stress tests? He's kind of answered. So she said, um, Erica said to see how the heart responds to stress. Why would we need to know that? To see if there's any rhythm changes. <laughs> So the number one reason why we do a stress test is because the patient had chest pain or other indications of an MI. So we're gonna put them at stress to see how they respond. Um, okay. Aren't they supposed to like avoid caffeine? and smoking before a certain time like two hours before yeah and a lot of times they'll be npo for a few hours beforehand just because of that so they don't try to stick anything up in there um but yeah caffeine smoking anything like that Okay, so let's go. Move my stuff up here. I'm trying to open. Let's talk talk heart cats. So let's talk about them in a broad sense. Okay, what is a cardiac cath. They can go through your vein and your artery, depending on which one. Um, and they can see different pressures within your cardiovascular system. Okay. Can we do anything else? You can remove clots too, right? Yeah, so we can remove tissue. We want to grab a sample. We can remove any type of blockage. But the cardiac casts allow us to get the internal visualization of the coronary vessels. So I think what sometimes people struggle with is that they think that we're going like into the heart, and we don't always. Sometimes it's the coronary vessels. So those vessels that supply blood. To the outside of the heart. Um, so, right heart caths, or how do I want to word this? If we're worried about an occlusion of a coronary vessel, they can do a cardiac cath. They're going to go into the coronary vessels, help open them up to restore blood flow, okay? Because that's what happens in an MI. Um, what are some of the bad things that can happen from a, a cardiac cath, either or? Dysrhythmias. Perforation. Mm -hmm. Retroperitoneal bleeding. 
Yeah, so let's talk about that. Where, how does retroperitoneal bleeding occur? I know that sounds weird, but. Okay, let me back up. Where can we access, or where do we go in for a cardiac cath? Is that your femoral artery? So with a, if they need a cardiac cath, we can either go through the femoral artery or where else? Radial. It's a radial. So if I'm going in through the radial, I'm just going up to my heart. But if I'm going in through the groin, I gotta go up and around to get to where I need to go, right? So with a femoral approach, that's when I have the risk of retroperitoneal bleeding. I'm not gonna have it with a radial approach because I'm nowhere near that area. So what does retroperitoneal bleeding look like? Would you see it like on the back? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of bruising in the back. Um, what is more concerning? Bleeding, bruising on your back or blood on your sheet? Ashley said it, the blood, right? Because if I actually have blood present, I have an active bleed. Okay, so I have blood coming out of the body. So I have to look at that insertion site to see what's going on. Um, what else, what else? Can you just explain what that retroperitoneal bleed is? Like what, what happened? Something got nicked along the way. We just have bleeding in, in the pathway to the heart because they're going to go up through the femoral artery and they're going to follow that artery and weave and bob all the way up to the aorta. And somewhere along the way, we just, we potentially have nicked something and caused some bleeding or there's just been some trauma. So depending on signs and symptoms, it would kind of dictate what's going to happen but for the most part, it's just going to be some bruising and it looks really scary. But if we have active internal bleeding, then we're going to see like the body swell up and some decreased um, like blood pressures and signs of hemorrhage. So for it, it to come out of the body, it would have to come out of the incision the, where they went in? Yes, because that's the only hole that they have right then or it's gonna just build up if it's severe enough. For the most part, it's not. It's just more or less bruising um, that we would monitor. And it's a, it's a very rare side effect. It really does, or complication, does not happen that much. Um, let's see. After a cardiac cath, what, what interventions would you put into place? If you go up through the femoral artery, then it's pressure dressing, right? They do have a, they can have a pressure dressing in place and they also have something else. They have a couple restrictions. Keep the legs straight for six hours. Mm -hmm. And the head of bed has to be at 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. Bed rest. What about, there we go. I was like, come on, give me the bed rest. Yep, we want bed rest. So we, they will be on bed rest for a longer amount of time than if we go through a radial approach. Radial approach typically does not have 
as mon as many issues as um, what you call it ephemeral approach. I know I'm struggling with that right now. Um, so know your safety concerns for each. I'd highlight that slide. <clears throat> um, okay. What is the difference in the vessels that we use for right versus left heart cath? The right end of the vein and the left end of the artery? Yes. So the left heart cath goes through an artery, the right goes through the vein. Which heart cath can be left in for monitoring purposes? Right. The right. We can leave those in place for a central venous pressure monitoring. Left, we go in, we do what we need to do, we go out, but right could potentially stay in. Um, let's see, what else? Bleeding precautions, fall risk, safety precautions, those will all be huge. Or just important to understand. I don't like. I shouldn't say the word huge. Um, yeah, this is above your pay grade. Okay. Signs and symptoms of bleeding. Signs and symptoms of hemorrhage would present themselves as. Tachycardia and hypotension. Uh, okay. Let's talk about angina. Any questions about angina? I found this on the web. Oh, stop talking. I don't care what you found on the web. So what's the difference between stable angina and unstable angina? One you can relieve with rest. Which one? Stable. Yeah. When we stop, the chest pain goes away. Um, why is unstable angina so, so dangerous? Early sign of uh, MI. We have occlusion of those coronary vessels. Blood cannot get through. That angina is telling us that, hey, my heart, the heart is saying, I'm not getting enough oxygen because these vessels are occluded. So we have to do something about it. Um, <clears throat> let's discuss nitro. Can anybody walk through or explain Explain the process of taking nitro for chest pain. I can try. <laughs> um, so usually they'll have it like on hand <clears throat> if they've had an issue with it like before. Um, and when they feel the onset of the angina, they can take their first nitro. And then, um, like, sit down and rest. And then, if it's not relieved it yet, take another one five minutes later. And then, if it's still not relieved, probably you're going to want to be calling 911 by then. And then you can take a third dose. So you can take up to three, five minutes apart. Mm -hmm. But if it's not relieved, probably after, is it after the second one, then you want to go in? I think, I think your ATI tells you that if you take your first nitro and the chest pain is not relieved, to call 911 and take a second one. Okay. So 
if the pain is not a zero, if the question says the patient reports their pain is now a four, we're giving them another dose, okay? Four is not zero. We want that pain gone. Um, but if they're at home, they want to call 911, take that second dose, and then they can get a third dose typically by EMS or themselves. It truly depends. But I'm almost positive that's what your ATI says. So what are the common issues or side effects of nitro? Headache. Right. Is a headache a bad thing? Or is it a sign of something wrong? No. So we tell them, take a Tylenol. Rest, water, what, what not. A headache is a normal, it's a normal complication of nitro. It's an expected thing. On the flip side, nitro does what? What's its job? Vasopressure. So vasodilator, it's going to relieve, really lower that blood pressure. So people who take nitro, what safety considerations do we need them to, do we have to keep in mind? Hypotension and your, how do you say it, your DFO? <laughs> we don't want them to done fall out. So making sure that we're keeping safety parameters in place. They are at risk for falling. Sudden drops in blood pressure. Patients on nitro should also not be taking any erectile dysfunction medications. It's one of the biggest lies too. I don't take those. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, what are, just a quick farm review, what are some ways that nitroglycerin can be given? Sublingual. Okay. Could it be um, an injection? Not an injection, but we do have nitro drips, so they can get it through an IV. Okay. And a patch. They have a patch. One more. Spray. Oh, two more. Yep, the spray. Did we already say the patch? We said the patch, but there's some, the patch itself is like a fentanyl patch. So it's just like clear and looks like that. But there's another way we can give nitro that's similar. Ointment. The paste. Yep. So we have the nitro paste. Um, so all of those can be used. Um, the spray common with EMS, that's what they give. So it's also given sublingually. The sublingual tablet, if you had to give instructions on how for your patient to take them, what would you instruct them to do? I know this sounds dumb, but we ask a lot of questions about this kind of stuff. Put under your tongue. Okay. And what? Let it dissolve. Let it dissolve. Don't drink anything. Let it sit there. It's going to melt on its own in a few seconds. You might feel some tingling. Um, we don't want you to swallow a pill. That's what it's getting down to. Little nitro bottles. Nitro in and of itself should be kept in a cool, dark place. That's why the nitro bottle is dark. If they're getting IV nitro, we have a, the bottle is dark too. We have like a bag we put over it to protect it from light. Um, if you do have to apply nitro either by a paste or by a patch, wear gloves because you can get that nitro on you and then feel the effects of the nitro and we don't want that to happen. Okay. So coronary artery disease. Oh, I skipped MI. Let's talk about MI. What questions do we have about MIs? Could you recognize one in a test question? Do you know what to do? 
What are your priority interventions? The EKG. Okay. We want to confirm that the MI is happening. Labs. Remember, yep. So we're going to check that troponin. What about pain medication? I kind of remember something where it's like, you have to look at the strip and if it's on, if it's a right side, is it the right sided heart failure? You can't give them medication or something. It's something to remember on the right side. Yeah. With nitro, if it's a right MI, it's really not going to be effective. So we talked about Mona. Remember morphine. We, it's not our priority. Okay. Our ASA is our aspirin and our antiplatelet meds. That's our priority. So yeah, I care about your pain, but I really want to make sure you don't die first. And these antiplatelets are the bigger priority. Oxygen, we only give if they need it. We're not going to give them oxygen unless they are hypoxic. So in terms of priorities, it's those antiplatelet medications. That's going to be very, very important. And they were finding that we were delaying giving those meds because we're so caught up in pain. The pain is not going to kill you. I mean, I know it might feel like it is, but not getting you those antiplatelet meds will. <clears throat> um, signs and symptoms of an MI. Chest pain, shortness of breath. They're different for women and men. Mm -hmm. Like nausea. Yep, the arm pain. They're pale. They're paler than me. They're pasty. They're sticky. They're wet. They look like a dead person already. If you've ever seen a corpse like in a, like at a funeral, they they look that pale. And they're cool and sticky. So um, let's see here. Treatment for MI. Beta blockers. They go right to the cath lab. We're going to go open up those vessels. So once the MI is confirmed, off to the cath lab they go. So to open up, they're going to be put on a whole bunch of medications afterwards to keep the vessels open. What lifestyle modifications would be important for somebody after an MI? Exercise, good diet. Specifically, what kind of diet? Low fat. Low sodium. Oh, yeah. yeah. Low, low fat, sodium. sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, how many grams of sodium? No more than two grams. Um, okay. There's a big one we have not talked about. Change your diet, exercise. No smoking. I was sitting there like this, Stephanie, you missed it. <laughs> oh, I always, I always talk to myself out loud and I'm like, I think it's smoking, but. <laughs> Yeah, so no smoking, low fat, low cholesterol, low sodium, exercise, um, 
That was two grams of sodium, right? Yes, two grams of sodium diet. Two, two, two. Anything more is too much. Okie dokie. Okay, so now back to coronary artery disease. Understand the disease, what happens to the vessels? What are our treatments for coronary artery disease? So if we're concerned about cholesterol, what are we gonna do? Put them on a cholesterol lowering med or try diet modifications first. Let's reduce those modifiable risk factors, right? So weight loss, fluids, low fat diet, and they can start them on a med, no smoking. Um, what, what are some potential complications of coronary artery disease? What can happen? What systems are affected? Your kidneys. So with coronary artery disease, your arteries are lined with plaque restricting blood flow. So coronary artery disease can lead to an MI, it can lead to a stroke, peripheral artery disease, any of your arteries get lined with gunk and can cause issues. So we can have circulatory issues. Um, so big picture. It's really hard, I, I get it, like I'm always like potential complications, but we always have to think worst case scenario, which I know we're always trying to stay on the positive side of things, like as humans, but we have to think like, okay, if I do this, what happens? And then what can happen? And then what can happen? It's like choose your own adventure books. I don't know if you guys remember those or not, but like you, you make a pathway, you make a decision, and then you're gonna see what's gonna happen from that. But if we don't take care of one disease, it can lead to this, which can lead to that, which can lead to this. So we gotta kind of branch out our brains that way. Um. Treatments for CAD, diet, exercise, statins. Not smoking. Worst case scenarios, we can do angioplasty, percutaneous coronary intervention. So they can go in, smush that plaque to the tops of the walls to restore blood flow. Put a stent in to keep it in place. Okay. Central lines, any issues with central lines? Sterility uses. All right. So with valve disorders, look at that pretty little chart that I made you. We talk about each of the valves, okay? And what we would find. If I have an aortic failure, if I have aortic regurge going on, what structure is going to be affected the most? Sorry, Amy, I didn't hear what you had said. <laughs> if I have an aortic valve issue, what, what's gonna happen? What's, what part of the heart is going to be effective? The left ventricle? Yeah, because that's what's behind it. Left ventricle, aorta, rest of the body. So think about the valve and what's behind it because that's where you're gonna see your issues. If I have a ventricular issue, I would have potential ventricular dysrhythmias. But if it's an atrial valve, I might have an atrial dysrhythmia. So just think about what's behind it. In terms of valves, if I need a replacement because repair just won't do, what are my options? Ooh. 
The mechanical or the bio? Okay, so the mechanical valve replacement or the biological valve replacement? Which one lasts forever? The mechanical. The mechanical is a machine. Machines last forever. That's the way that I remember it, okay? If I have a mechanical valve though, what do I need to be on for the rest of my life? The anticoagulants. Biological valves don't last as long, but I only have to be on anticoagulants for three months, but they may need to be replaced. What are some potential, oh, this is a tough question. What is a potential complication of having a heart valve replaced? What do you have to be concerned about? Not bleeding, we'll, we'll, we'll skip bleeding. We know bleeding because they're on anticoagulants, but valves are more at risk for certain inflammatory problems is it like endopartum? It is. That is. So because it's it's foreign, it's going to attract the valves. I like this. The valves are going to attract bugs and stuff more. I forget what the word is. I have a word for it. Vegetation. The valves are going to attract more vegetation and put them at high risk for developing endocarditis. Um, so people with valves, prophylactic antibiotics before the dentist. Watching for signs and symptoms of bleeding. All that good stuff. Um, trying to think. So, of your inflammatory diseases of the heart. Remember what's different, okay? On your PowerPoint, there's a symptom that's different. It has a star next to it, like rheumatic endocarditis. We only get it from strep, untreated strep. That's what's different. Its symptoms are gonna be similar to everybody else's, but they had that strep infection. Infective endocarditis. Our IV drug users are at high risk for developing this. Pericarditis. Pain when the pain is relieved when they lean forward. Because their symptoms are all really, really similar. Fever, chest pain. And also, if you have issues thinking about the name, remember your, your, how words are put together. Itis, it's an inflammation. Peri, meaning the pericardium. So it's an inflammation of the pericardium. Myocarditis, that inner structure of the heart, that's irritated or infected. Is there a unique symptom for myocarditis? Yes, and I don't remember what it is. It was the megaly. The cardio, yeah, there it is, the cardiomegaly. I'm like, I don't have that PowerPoint pulled up. Treatments are going to be pain medication, rest, and treating the infection if it's an infectious cause. and not using drugs. Okay. Any other questions about valves or inflammation, inflammatory diseases of the heart? All right then, let's talk about heart failure. So what would we see in left-sided heart failure 
that we wouldn't see in right-sided heart failure. Lung issues. Yep. Left side, well, left side lungs, right rest of the body. Okay. So right-sided heart failure is where we get the edema, the ascites, the hepatobiliary congestion, everything else. Left-sided lungs, left-sided heart failure is the lungs. So pulmonary issues, pulmonary um, holding on to fluid, crackles. This is all backflowing. Left-sided heart failure causes, can cause right-sided heart failure. And with chronic heart failure, we're going to have symptoms of both. Um, how do we diagnose heart failure? BNP. The BNP, yep. We'll also do echoes and look at that ejection fraction to see how well the heart's pumping as a whole. Treatments for heart failure. Digoxin. And then again, that's kind of a broad thing because it depends on what symptoms we're having. So if we're having issues with fluid, we're gonna give diuretics. If we're having issues with the heart involvement or like the heart pumping, digoxins will help reduce the workload of the heart. Um, typically, we do see low blood pressure with heart failure because the heart can't pump it out the way it's supposed to because the pump is failing. So we have to watch for symptomatic um, decreased cardiac output. So hypotension, lethargy, lightheadedness. Um, what lifestyle changes would you encourage your patient to make with congestive heart failure? Fluid restriction. 100% because they're probably going to be retaining it. What no. else am I going to restrict? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. What was that? Definitely not smoking or alcohol. <laughs> okay. Pretty sure alcohol. If we're restricting water, what else do we want to make sure that we're lowering sodium sodium okay water follows salt so people that have a lot of salt will hold out of fluid and if they already can't get rid of the fluid and have too much building on it's just a, it's a nightmare so um exercise is tolerated like you mentioned no smoking what should they do every day Weights. Daily weights. Whew, sorry. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Let me find my Okay. Sorry, I was just checking on some things to make sure that I talk about everything. Um, treatments also for heart failure, potentially that LVAD device or a heart transplant, depending on the patient and really what's going on with them. Um, if they're, they're able to do so. Heart failure can lead to pulmonary edema, which we kind of touched on already. Too much fluid in the lungs, making it hard to breathe. Um, an MI puts them at risk for this. High blood pressure, heart failure. Um, and again, anxiety cough, pink frothy sputum, crackles. 
flash pulmonary edema is life threatening where it comes on very, very quickly, making it really hard to breathe. Um, cool, clammy skin usually requires to be intubated and to, to get fluid off very, very quickly. Um, and then non-acute just builds up over time. That's regular, that's regular pulmonary edema. Flash edema again, which come on very, very quickly. All right. <clears throat> What specific cardiac rhythm questions do you have? I have a hard time with the two different, um, the heart blocks, like the different degrees, because they're so similar. Okay. So let's, we'll go, okay, we'll go over that. <clears throat> so remember your EKG is looking at the electricity in the heart. And our nodes are the ones that dictate our rhythms, our SA, our AV, the whole electrical pathway. When we're talking about bundle branch blocks, some kind of message down in the bundle branches is not getting relayed. That's what blocks are. The message is not getting through. So, Robit's type one, heart block type one, the wanky box. You have a P wave, and you have a QRS, and it should be only this far apart. But then you go to the next one, and it's this far apart. Then you go to the next one, and it's this far apart. So it's longer, longer, and longer until all of a sudden you don't have a QRS. So that's the um, second degree type one. And really, what we do with that for treatment is stop the medications that they're on and watch for being symptomatic. With your Type two, uh, your second degree type two. Let me see if I can pull that thing back up real quick. Hold on. Um, do, 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 where'd you go? Uh, this is not what I wanted. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up that website and I can't find it. Here it is. Oh, you don't have to make noise though. Okay. So with your second degree type two, your PR interval is gonna be the same. You're gonna miss a QRS, but the PR interval doesn't get longer, longer, and longer. So with type second degree type one, you get longer, 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 and it goes away. With second degree type two, it's the same, the same, the same, boom, it's gone. The same, the same, the same, boom, it's gone. Does that help? Maybe. So this is more concerning. Um, and this can potentially be transcutaneous paste. The other medications will be stopped. This rhythm can lead to complete heart block or type three. So in case you guys forgot, let me, I'll put this back in the chat for you guys if you want to go back and look at these rhythms again. Remember, there's some on there that we don't do. We It's above your pay grade. Um, but I will definitely, encourage you guys to go back and use that chart that we created in class because we want you to know how do you treat it so what are let me start stop that what is the difference between defibrillation 
and cardio version. Cardio version is timed out and planned and a defibrillation is not timed out and also emerging? Pretty much. Also, our defibrillated patients don't have what? A pulse. They don't have a pulse, but our cardioverted patients do. So the goal of cardioversion, it's synchronized, it's planned, it's gonna be at a specific point to get the heart back into a rhythm. With defibrillation, there is no pulse. We're just trying to get it back started because there is still electrical activity, but we're gonna, we're gonna try to get it back into, into rhythm. So what rhythms do we consider shockable or ones that we would defibrillate? VTAC, VFib, asystole, and PA. So we can't shock PEA and asystole, but they don't have a pulse. So with those two, we'd start high quality CPR and give drugs, but they're not shockable. But you are correct that they don't have a pulse. So the rhythms that we would shock are going to be pulseless VTAC and VFib. So if a patient's talking to you guys, like the question the patient reports, that means they're awake and they have a pulse because you can't talk if you don't have a pulse, all right? So that's one kind of indication that like, okay, they have a pulse, so I know it's not going to be pulseless VTAC. <clears throat> so when you go into a room, you see the monitor, you're like, oh crap, it looks like they're in VTAC, go into the room, the first thing you need to do is assess, do they have a pulse? Because if they don't, then I'm gonna shock you. But if they do, we're gonna do other methods first. We're gonna give you meds, try and get you back into a normal rhythm. Vasovagal, bear down, that kind of thing. So let's check if they have a pulse. <clears throat> um, what happens in atrial fibrillation? The atrium are just beating really fast and it's not pushing the blood through the heart. Yeah, they're quivering or fibrillating. That's what it means. So they're just going like this instead of going like this. So that's why we get those little bumps on the strip. How do we treat AFib? What was that? I'm sorry, Angela. A beta blocker. Medications. What if it just started? It's new and they're symptomatic. So they have some poor cardiac output. Could they do the vagal maneuver? They can try, yeah, they can try. With new onset atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter when they're symptomatic, so by new onset, I mean within like a day, three days, they can do a cardioversion to get them back into that rhythm, um, especially if they're symptomatic. Some people live with AFib their entire lives and it's not an issue, or they don't do cardioversion. If they have atrial fibrillation, what medication do you anticipate this patient being on? Anticoagulants. 100%. Um, That's it. What other EKG questions do you have? Or rhythm questions do you have? Was it the SVT that you do the vagal maneuver on? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, one last question. Was the flutter the one that had the sawtooth pattern? Okay. Yep. Very, very distinct. It stands out. Is there a uh, symptom difference between a fib and a flutter? Not that I'm aware of. Usually it's just what you see on the monitor. Maybe with atrial flutter, they'll feel more palpitations because the heart rate is faster, typically. That would be the only thing. Um, you walk into your patient's room and do an assessment and find that their heart rate is 58. Walk me through some thought processes here. Are you freaking out? Are you okay? Are you getting the crash cart? What are we doing? That or may are you be asking normal questions? Them. It may be normal for them. So let's ask some questions. Do you know what your resting heart rate normally is? Are you tired? Are you weak? Are you dizzy? Have we taken any new medications? So sinus Brady isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially if they're not symptomatic. Remember, athletes and runners tend to have way lower heart rates than the rest of us. So we have to do a little digging. Um, sinus tachycardia is characterized by what? What, what makes sinus tack sinus tack? A fast, regular heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And by fast, you mean a rate over? Over 100. Over 100. So what would, what would our treatments be? Or wait, let me stop that. Ignore that question. What can cause sinus tachycardia? Anxiety. Mm -hmm. Medications. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Dehydration. 100%. Infections. So keep that in mind. And then the treatments for sinus tack will pretty much depend on the cause. Usually sinus tack can resolve itself if we take care of the root cause, but fluids can also be administered if not contraindicated. And then if it starts to get really, really up there, that's when we can run into the SVT. So would you chase this with like a beta blocker then? Oh, truly depends on everything going on but it, it potentially can be, and if their blood pressure can handle it. Because if they're hypotensive, but tachycardic, I'm not giving them a beta blocker. Okay. Um, let's talk pacemakers and ICDs. Any questions about these guys? Be comfortable with the H2. One helps with rhythm, one shocks. So a pacemaker gets placed to help maintain a rhythm, either atrial or ventricular or both. An ICD is a defibrillator. So it's going to shock the heart if it goes into a ventricular dysrhythmia and say, uh-uh, not today. So you can have a pacemaker or you can have an ICD or you can have a combination. They're, they're different though. So make sure you understand the difference. After one is being placed, what safety concerns, what teachings need to be done with these? Not raising your arm, no golfing, avoiding trauma to that area, letting metal detector people know like, hey, I got a pacemaker. If an ICD fires, they're gonna get that zap and they're gonna know they need to seek medical attention. 
their heart was just in a, in a lethal rhythm and a year that stopped it. Um, hiccups. Hiccups are a sign that the pacemaker wire has become displaced. So if the hiccups don't resolve, that's something that they need to report. And that's a pacemaker thing. There was a question, I think, with a central line and hiccups. But people, or there was a question about hiccups and people pick central line, but it was the pacemaker. So pacemaker hiccups. Um, all right. PVD and PAD. Remember peripheral artery disease is CAD, coronary artery disease in your legs. People with peripheral artery disease will have diminished pulses. They'll be lacking hair on their legs and their feet will be pale when elevated, but red when in a dependent position. We want the ruber. The legs should, the feet should be red. When your feet are in a dependent position, so they're flat on the floor, it is forcing the blood down and will help relieve pain. So that ruber is a good thing. When you have PAD and you elevate your legs, it has, it's not going to get through, and that's where that pallor comes through. Intermittent claudication is that like angina of the butt. So with movement, they can develop some pain. When they stop, it goes away. That's a telltale sign of PAD. So treatment of peripheral artery disease is going to be same thing for coronary artery disease and walking programs. Walking to the point of pain, stopping, and then going again. We diagnose PAD with an MRI or an MRA. And for testing purposes, they talk to you about the ankle, ankle brachial rate index. You won't see that in this class, but you might see it on a future exam somewhere else. That's what's used to diagnose it. In practice, not so much. Um, venous insufficiency. We the veins take blood back to the heart. So with venous insufficiency, the veins in the legs are failing. So we're gonna have more pooling of blood in those extremities. So there'll be some more swelling and some um, coolness. Venous insufficiency are at high risk of developing venous ulcers that typically form on like the malleoli bone. Venous insufficiency needs to be treated with compression. Is it swelling, guys? When something's swelling, swelling, swollen, we compress it. Okay. Um, with peripheral artery disease, they like it warm. But we don't apply direct heat. All right. Heating pads are a no-no. We can do warm compresses raise the temperature, put on socks, but we cannot put direct heat on peripheral artery disease. Decreased sensation plus heat equals burns. But with PVD, we're gonna give them compression. And that they them we want to elevate. With PVD, we do want to elevate because we wanna help the blood get back to the heart. Anything that's still not sticking out with those? All right, move on. We talked about blood clots, prevention, STDs, medications, movement. DVTs are diagnosed with ultrasound. Symptoms include swelling, redness, 
pain. We treat with anticoagulants, compression, fluids. Hypertension. You guys have known about hypertension since day one. Are there specific questions about hypertension you still have? Know your meds. Okay. At least your classifications. Be able to identify a beta blocker. Be able to identify an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. The goal of hypertension is to prevent injury, to lower the blood pressure. What is the number one cause of a hemorrhagic stroke? Uncontrolled blood pressure. So hemorrhagic strokes are due to busted blood vessels because the pressure has been too high and has caused bleeding in an area. We talk about aneurysms in a sense. We talk more about like the triple A's, the abdominal aneurysms, but the same thing happens in the brain. Um, and even we don't talk about cerebral aneurysms as a whole, we talk about the hemorrhagic stroke. Symptoms of stroke. Our goal with strokes is to prevent secondary injury. What does a stroke look like? Facial droop, slurred speech, confusion, weakness. How do we diagnose a stroke? Right. Be fast. So we do the initial diagnosis, like we do the screening, the be fast. If we wanted to confirm that a stroke was happening, what would we do? Would you do like the CT or MRI? Yep. We're going to do a CT scan because it's quickest. Remember, ischemic strokes don't show up right away, but hemorrhagic do. So we can see the blood in the brain. Um, if we're concerned about a stroke, we are not giving contrast, okay? So it'll be a non-contrast. We don't wanna push anything else into there. And if there's already fluid that can cause issues and if there's a, a clot, it's not gonna go anywhere and cause more issues. So um, TPA, we use for ischemic strokes. Those little plaques and clots that have burst off, typically it's, the, it's from the neck, from coronary artery disease. Um, so the contraindication, safety concerns, no recent bleeding, no recent strokes, that sort of thing. Uh, no pregnancy. How do we determine the severity of a stroke? What screening tool do we use to determine how bad the stroke is? Is that the NIHSS thing? Yeah, that is the NIH stroke scale. So that will determine that we use that through progression to see how things are. Motor function, grass skills, all that good stuff. Um, again, our goal is to prevent secondary injury. So falls, skin, aspiration. Left-sided injuries result in right-sided deficits. Right-sided injuries result in left. It's the opposite, okay? Um, Remember therapeutic communication? How would you talk to somebody who's nonverbal? Um, 
if they're having weakness and deficits, what are they at risk for? Um, what other questions about strokes? What's not, uh, is there anything you're not sure about, not clear about? Okay, let's move on to them bones. Any specific musculoskeletal questions? What's the difference between an arthroscopy and an arthroplasty? Arthroplasty, they're repairing. Arthroscopy, they're going in and looking. Yep, it's a scope. It's giving us a picture of what's going on. So our side, our teachings afterwards are gonna be different. We're not gonna minimize movement for days after a scope. We want you moving again. You're covered with a Band-Aid for the most part. You know, if you develop bleeding, that's a complication, but we typically don't see that. A joint replacement requires more. Um, if I have a hip replacement, how should my body be? How should my legs be? Straight, no hip flexion. So after a hip replacement, if my legs are like this, that's bad. I want my legs apart, okay? That's why we use those abductor pillows. If my legs are adducted, so close to my body, that runs the risk of the joint popping out of place. So that's bad. I want my legs, this, this sounds bad, I want my legs open, <laughs> like they need to be. Otherwise that hip is gonna come into place. With, um, walkers for movement if they have a knee replacement no more big knee deep knee bends until cleared which they might not ever be um bleeding pain anticoagulants positioning is big though if i have a hip replacement not turning them onto that affected side or at least during a fracture What about amputations? What's your priority with somebody with an amputation? Like they come in and their hand is in a bag. What's your priority? Keep the limb cold, like on ice. Okay, before even that though. Circulation. So what would we need to have in place? A tourniquet. And we don't touch it. We make sure that tourniquet's in place and we leave it alone. <clears throat> but we have to stop that bleeding. And then we care about the lid on ice and all that kind of stuff. And the reason why I say that is because if we don't stop the bleeding, it doesn't matter if that limb was on ice or not. <laughs> because we're not going to be alive. Um, do, 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 do. Osteoporosis, so good. Look at your imaging, how we diagnose it. DEXA scans, it's an x-ray. It's quick, it's dirty, it gives us what we want. No metal, because we don't want to see jewelry present. They do have to lay down for a little bit, but it's quick. Um, who is at risk for osteoporosis? Greatest at risk. Menopausal woman. Mm -hmm. And more petite. We see more, we see more um, osteoporosis with our, our delicate little old ladies than anybody else. Um, smokers, alcoholics, also risk factors. 
for nutrition. Was there something with celiac on that as well? Was celiac one of them? I feel like something we did something with celiac. I know that nutrition was. I could be wrong. I just. I'm trying to think through the thought process. It very well may could be because if there's a malabsorptive issue, then possibly. But I'm not sure. I don't think we had that listed as one of the risk factors. If you looked at a person, how could you, what is a warning sign of osteoporosis? Just by looking at them. Kyphosis? That's that upper back. How do you feel about fractures? Okay. Your slides do a pretty good job of breaking those, the, the pictures down comminuted, all little pieces, displaced, breaking, the, you know, out of place and not in line. Um, six P's with, ass with assessment of the neurovascular system. Talk to me about compartment syndrome. What is compartment syndrome? It's where the limb or whatever's affected swells so much that it starts cutting off the circulation. Mm -hmm. So this can happen for any number of reasons. We commonly see it with casts that are too tight. So they'll have pain that is disproportionate to their injury, they're screaming, they're swelling, poor vascular, it's vascular compromise. So we need to either remove the mask, the mask, remove the cast, or they'll cut a window into it to relieve some of the pressure. Um, fat embolism, most commonly after what? Like a femur fracture? Is it a long bone fracture? Yep, long bone. So femur, pelvis, those are the big ones that we see that. Poor respiration, pain, TKA, osteomyelitis. I don't know. How do you, any outstanding questions about musculoskeletal? Could you brush through just the different tractions real quick? or just make to remember about that? So skin traction, we're using the skin to help pull things back into alignment. Skeletal traction, pins are surgically placed into bones. Weights are attached to help pull things back into place. So skeletal traction is much more invasive, further risk of complications, but used in severe cases where we need to get those bones back into alignment. Um, pin care, infection prevention will be very important with skeletal traction, as well as what? I know you guys remember this one. They have the pins, they have the weights. Don't touch the weights, leave the weights alone. The weights should not be resting on anything. They shouldn't be touching anything. They should be free hanging and we leave them alone. Um, the fixation external is all that hardware that's on the outside of a bone. Internal are like plates and screws on the inside that you're gonna see. Um, any other questions about the traction?
Okay, so GI. Um, what do 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 do? So testing, our GI testing, our EGDs, our colonoscopies, our ERCPs. Those are our big ones, right? Um, what patient education would you want to provide to somebody who's getting a colonoscopy? You have to do the bowel prep and then NPO after midnight, clear liquids only the day before. Mm -hmm. Drink everything. Your stool should be too clear, pale yellow color like Mountain Dew. Um, we do this so we can take a look around at your large intestine, identify lesions, remove any polyps, look for anything not normal. This is how we diagnose Crohn's or UC or cancers. Um, what else? That's pretty much it. EGD, my favorite. Down throat. Take a look around. We can remove tissue, we can pull objects out, but it gives us a good look of that upper GI system. EGDs require conscious, conscious sedation. So whatever goes along in lines with that. We're worried about gag reflex afterwards, immediately afterwards, because they might use some like tropical stuff, to tropical, topical stuff to help with secretions and numbing. Um, but immediately afterwards, we're very concerned about the gag reflex. So we, we want them until the gag reflex is returned, nothing by mouth. Um, potential for perforation and infection is rare, but a potential complication. ERCP is an EGD, but will visualize more of the biliary system, the pancreas, uh, um, gallbladder, can help with removal of stones and that sort of thing. GI series, that's when we're drinking the barium. If it's an upper series or if it's a lower series, they're getting the enema of barium. So they need to be cleaned out and then they're lit up. Barium will turn the stools white. We want to increase fluids, hydration, maybe even give them a laxative or something to help force the barium out of their system. Uh, procedures. How do we feel about tube feedings? Pretty okay. How can patients get tube feedings? By what methods? I saw somebody go like this for the nose. So they can get it in an NG tube. Or they can get um, like a peg tube, a gastric tube into the stomach. So remember, enteral feedings are going to go in through one of those two ways, whereas parenteral feedings, TPN, are only through a central line. Tube feedings are used to help supplement nutrition. So maybe they need more calories than they can possibly consume. They might get some extra nutrition, malnutrition, potentially. Um, or if they have an injury to this area and they have a peg tube, it truly depends, or they're high risk for aspiration. What position does somebody need to be in if they are receiving tube feedings? They need to be sitting at least semi fowlers. Even high fowlers can be too complicated. They cannot lay flat. If you need to do a bed change, if you need to give them a bed bath, pause that tube feeding. They're at high risk for aspiration. Um, remember your complications, okay? Diarrhea is a complication. We see it a lot, but it could be the wrong formula. It's not normal. Dumping syndrome, too much sugar causes massive diarrhea. Overfeeding, we check a residual and we have two times the hourly rate that we're pulling out. That means the food is not being digested properly because it's built up too fast. Yes, we gotta notify the provider and slow that rate down. Um, TPN, only through a central line, only, only, only. So central line things go along with this. 
TPN, 24 hours for the bag and the tubing. If the new bag does not arrive within 24 hours, what do you do? Give them dextrose. Specifically, what solution? Is it D10? It is D10. So if that new bag is not going to be there in time, we have to give them D10 until the new bag can arrive. Why? Because they could become hypoglycemic. So patients on TPN need at minimum every six hour blood finger sticks to check their glucose. Some places will do every four. Um, so we have to be checking their blood sugar regularly. And yeah, we don't want them to bottom out. So that's going to prevent that from happening. Um, new bag, new line, filter. They have the filter on the TPN. Paracentesis. We do it to drain fluid. Looks kind of yellowish, done at the bedside. We weigh before and after, we measure, we give albumin, but we do it to help relieve some of the pressure in the abdomen from being so large in the buildup of fluid. Um, what about ostomies? Anything about ostomies? Remember ostomies is a whole anywhere, it's a new outlet. I can have colostomies, I can have urostomies, I can have nephrostomies. What do I need to be concerned about with any type of ostomy? Skin integrity. Okay. I wanna look at that stoma. I have to look at the color of the stoma. A black stoma indicates ischemic, it's dead. A red angry stoma could be infection. A pale stoma could mean I don't have enough blood flow. Blue or purple, cyanosis or damage. So it should it should be a normal color. Um, remember, with colostomies, depending on where they are located, will dictate how the stool is, the consistency. The closer to the anus the ostomy is, the more, for, the more firm the stool will be. The further away, the more liquidy it's going to be. Um, okay. Winding the um, GI disorders. Questions on GERD, hernias, varices, anything that's not clear you wanna go over? Gastritis, peptic ulcer disease. If I have an ulcer and it erodes through my stomach, what, what issues would I have? Peritonitis. Okay, perfect. And what would that present itself as? Infection, basically. So, pain, fever, rigid yeah. abdomen. Yep. Pain, fever, rigid, board like abdomen. Very dangerous. So, we want to treat ulcers. Um, I feel like you guys are probably pretty good on diarrhea, constipation, all that kind of stuff know how to treat them, how to prevent them. That is very important as a nurse. Let's talk about bowel obstructions, small bowel obstructions, okay? Um, how do I know that I have one or that your patient has one? What are some signs?
The small bowel one is the um, where you can get where you're throwing up the your bowels, right? Like you're throwing up basically feces. Yep. And we'll typically have like absent bowel sounds below anywhere past the obstruction because nothing's getting through and it's not moving. So they're going to be constipated, abdominal pain, and vomiting fecal matter. Yummy. Treatment for a small bowel obstruction, the NG tube. Because remember, NG tubes can either pull stuff out, put stuff in, compress. They have lots of different functions. Um, but yeah, we're going to get that NG tube in it. We're going to set it to suction. And hopefully, the suction can suck out the obstruction. In severe cases, they may need surgery. But we're going to try the NG tube first. If it is pulling out fecal matter, what do you expect to see in the NG canister? Fecal matter? Yeah. Brown, green, yellow, gross drainage coming out of there. The only thing we don't really want to see is red because red is usually an indication of blood. But if I'm pulling that, that stuff out, that's a normal thing. That's an expected finding. Um, <clears throat> okay. These patients are typically NPO too because the food can't go anywhere. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about, uh, any questions about Crohn's and UC? Inflammatory bowel issues, be comfortable with the difference. They both are awful. I'm gonna preface that. Crohn's, we have, up to five or so loose stools a day. You see up to 20. You see literally ulcers forming in the mucosa of the large intestine. Not fun. Crohn's can be anywhere in that digestive tract. Visually, if we were doing a scope, Crohn's is going to have that cobblestoning pattern to the mucosa. Crohn's will have those ulcers developed. Um, these are patients that potentially, especially you see, they might have TPN at some point because we want to rest their bowel. That's what bowel rest means. We don't want them to eat because we, we need to let that heal. So they would get TPN. Um, what else was I going to say? Low residue diets. We want to prevent constipation. Mm, what else? Diverticulitis is, is it included in that group. I don't want to poo poo it and say it's not as bad, but considering the other two, I, in my personal opinion, we can control diverticulitis with diet. So remember the little di diverticula have formed these little finger like patch pouches. They get infected from seeds or nuts or popcorn and can become infection. It is painful. We want to prevent constipation with these patients as well. Um, and they can potentially have them surgically removed. But diet is important with those patients. Upper GI bleed and lower GI bleeds. If it's an upper GI bleed, you're going to have red vomit. Blood, hematoemesis, because it's closer to where it's coming out of. And then you'd have melana, blood in the stool, dark blood, because it had to go all the way through the digestive tract. With a lower GI bleed, you're going to have hematochesia, so bright red blood coming out in the stool, because it's closer to where it's coming out of. And then coffee ground emesis, because it's further away. So the blood is going to be closest 
to whatever type of bleed you have. So if it's upper, your vomit is gonna be red. If it's lower, your stools are gonna be red because lower is closer to the butt, upper is closer to the mouth, okay? Um, all right. Anything left from GI? Causes of obesity, be comfortable. Diet, exercise, treatments, understanding bariatric surgeries. We have four kinds, two groups. What belong to which? What are the diet restrictions for which? Um, patient education. I can eat whatever I want now is an indication that they need further teaching. Don't drink your fluids, or don't, I'm sorry, that wasn't right. Don't drink your fluids with meals. We got smaller, smaller area to work with, so in between meals. Our biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch are reserved for the greatest, highest amounts of weight loss, our most obese patient. That and the Ruin Y, vitamins and mineral supplementation for the rest of their lives high risk of developing pernicious anemia. Our restrictive, our banding in our sleeve is really just gonna cut down the size. Diet and exercise still need to be maintained. And a lot goes into determining if you're gonna have a surgery or not. You can't just walk in and say, hey, I'd like to schedule a Ruin Y. Months of planning go into this. Um, our Ruin Y and our duodenal switch, high risk of an anastomotic leak. So an anastomosis is when we're putting two things together newly, we can leak contents into the peritoneal cavity, peritonitis can happen. So with those two surgeries, high risk of anastomotic leak, high risk of peritonitis. So what does that look like? We went over that. Um, and also the dumping syndrome. Dumping syndrome occurs when there's too much sugar. So to reduce the sugar, increase the protein. Anything that's still not clear about bariatric surgeries? Is there a specific question about one of them? All I got in the survey was bariatric surgeries and it's really broad. So I don't know what to say about them. So if there's something specific, please let me know. All right, then. Let's talk diabetes. What specifically about diabetes do you have questions on? We maybe go through the differences between DKA and the, um, I just forgot what it's called, HHS. Yep, absolutely. So, DKA primarily, but not always, primarily with type one diabetics. It is characterized by an elevated blood glucose, two small respirations, the fruity odor to the breath, ketones in the urine, and acidosis. That's why it says ketoacidosis. There's ketones and the acid, the blood is acidic. With HHS, we don't have all that. We have a high, high glucose. It'll be much higher actually, um, but there's no ketones and there's no acidosis. There is a high risk of seizures though. We treat them both very similarly. It's just gonna be their symptoms that like jump out at us. And I don't want you to get caught up on a blood glucose because I've seen somebody in DKA, well, with a blood sugar of like 1300 which most people are like, oh, that sounds like HHS. No, because there were ketones in the urine and they were type one diabetic. And they didn't have the seizure risk and everything else. So elevated blood glucose. But with HHS, we're typically gonna see over 600. Um, <clears throat> so both will have polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, signs of high blood sugar. Um, 
but the, the key is the differences between the two. So with DKA, we're going to be more acidotic. We're not going to have any issues with ABGs with HHS. It's going to be uh, normal. Um, and then the treatment for these, IV insulin, it's going to lower that blood sugar. Uh, frequent finger sticks. And then insulin, uh, we have to watch their potassium. Insulin bonds to potassium and will reduce the serum potassium rate. So it's not uncommon to see somebody in DKA and we're treating them for it with low potassium. So we have to watch that. Um, if we get the blood, when we get the blood glucose to 250, we're gonna treat them with some D5. Yes, it's sugar, but we're trying to prevent cerebral edema. <clears throat> and watch for any signs and symptoms of seizures if it's HHS. What are the potential causes of DKA? Let's talk about that. Type one diabetic. Okay. Not taking insulin. Not taking their insulin. Stress. Oops, sorry, Rachel. Oh, I was just gonna say illness. Yep, illness. All of those, because it puts a stress on the body, raises the blood glucose. With DKA, the body is going to break down fats and release these ketones because there's not enough insulin to break down the carbohydrates. So there's not insulin to break down the carbs. So what's gonna happen is the body's gonna break down fats and then ketones are released. Building it up, creating an acidotic environment. And then we have the high blood sugar because there's not enough insulin. With HHS, there's still some insulin present in the body, but not enough. Um, but because there's still some present, the ketones aren't formed. And then HHS is usually caused by other conditions like an MI or kidney failure or kidney, like bad, the kidneys aren't working right um, or other illness. Could you explain why why their blood sugar goes low and it would cause peripheral edema. Like we give them D, D, um, D5 to, or D10, whatever, whichever, to prevent that. But how does that happen? How does peripheral edema happen? Or the cerebral edema? Cerebral edema, it has to do with the molecules and osmolarity inside the blood and the brain is just more susceptible and more sensitive to it. So if we drop the blood sugar too fast, it pulls things away and then it just causes like a reaction to happen. So we don't, we wanna bring it down obviously to a good level, but we still need to restore some glucose into the bloodstream to prevent that from happening. It has to do with diffusion and the way that things work that way with the sugar molecules and hydration. Thanks. Um, be comfortable with your insulins. Okay. What's rapid? What's regular? How quickly does it act? What interventions would you have into place? Signs and symptoms of low blood sugar. Can you recognize low blood sugar? So with hypoglycemia, shaking, sweaty, maybe a decreased level of consciousness. We give them carbohydrates to treat this, to offset this. We wanna raise their blood sugar because it's low. If we are concerned about 
they're swallowing, don't put anything in their mouth. If they're losing consciousness, don't put anything in their mouth. But if they're talking to you and are just like, I know my blood sugar is low, I'm feeling low, I need some juice or something. Orange juice, graham crackers, 15 grams of carbohydrates, something that they need to help raise that up. And then we monitor. If they're losing consciousness, that's when we're going to give that amp of D50. Um, <clears throat> so cold and clammy, give some candy. Hot and dry, sugar high. We got to get some insulin in them. Who can get um, metformin? Type 2. Type 2. Only. We do not give type 1 diabetics oral hypoglycemics. We watch kidneys, high risk of lactic acidosis, no, no contrast. All right. Anything else with diabetes? All right. GU. So these last two symptoms, systems, GU and skin, are most recent. What specific questions are you still foggy on, or are things not clear? Issues with dialysis, kidney disease, infections, anything. What, okay, so hemodialysis, how is this done? What does the patient need? A fistula. A fistula or graft, or if those aren't ready yet, how else can they get dialysis? Through that mahooker, through that chest port, okay? We should always assess the fistula or graft for what? Brilly and thrill. Mm -hmm. So we do dialysis because we need to take over for the kidneys, right? The, the kidneys aren't functioning. They're not filtering. We're going to have a buildup of toxins. What are expected findings of somebody who needs dialysis? What would we see? You mean like decreased kidney function? Yep, so we'd have decreased kidney function. So we'd have an elevated BUN and creatinine, like very high before dialysis. What physical assessments or what labs would we see? like all the electrolytes and stuff would be increased except for sodium, right? Typically. Mm -hmm. So patients that need dialysis, they're gonna be hypertensive. Kidneys aren't functioning, they're not releasing renin. We're going to see high blood pressure. This is an expected finding. Is it good? No, but I expect it to be elevated. And then after dialysis, it's gonna be normal because we got too much fluid on board. Um, electrolytes, like you mentioned, I expect potassium to be elevated and calcium to be elevated. So if I see a potassium of 6.2 on a normal person, I'd be like, oh crap, but somebody who's undergoing dialysis, if they need it, that makes sense that it's elevated because once they have their dialysis, it's going to go back down. However, we still need to watch for things like arrhythmias because potassium can cause arrhythmias. <clears throat> um, but certain things we, we're gonna see before, before dialysis happens, like elevated blood pressure, elevated electrolytes, 
really crappy kidney function, um, holding onto fluid, increased weight. These are all things that we're going to see. By having dialysis, it's going to remove water, reduce the weight, reduce the blood pressure, reduce the electrolytes. Um, okay. Untreated UTIs can lead to what? I think you actually said it, pyelonephritis. So we can have, those are severe infections. We'd see some impairment in the kidneys, a lot of pain, fevers, can also lead to sepsis if that doesn't get treated as well. So making sure that we're discussing proper hygiene. Um, I'm not sure then. Um, what about skin? Anything you're still not clear on with skin? Or anything that popped up from last week? You want to talk about folliculitis? Sure. Infected like hair follicles, pretty much it. Can remove the hair, remove the infection. Can be kind of painful. Um. On your review concepts, like it has fungal infections, remember tinea is the fungal infection and the word after it is what part is affected. So if it's caporis, that's ringworm. Tinea capitis, that's fungus on the head. Tinea pedis, that's fungus on the feet, like athlete's foot. Um, Cleanliness, hygiene, wear shoes, not barefoot. I'm not sure. Um, so I added, I think you guys can see it. I added two, I'm kind of calling them drop-in sessions. There's one on Friday morning and one on Monday evening. So if you're studying, and you're like, crap, I just truly do not understand X, Y, Z. You can sign up on the calendar and the, the Zoom code is in there and you can drop in, we can discuss it, you can go on your way. So I'm starting it, um, the one on Friday, I think it's a Friday. Let me pull up my calendar real quick. Um, I think is at 9 a.m. Yeah, on Friday, it'll be open at 9 a.m., but if nobody comes by 9.15 and you try to come at 9.30 and I'm not there, that's why. Okay, so I'll be there as long as people need. And then I'm also doing one Monday evening at 7 p.m., okay? And the Zoom code is listed. So if you go to the CTL um, Canvas, you can sign up right on there. Um, and we do ask that you sign up because then I know to also that people are going to come, but just come with any last minute questions, anything that you, you're not clear about, or if you can't shoot me an email um, and I'll get back to you over. I don't have anything going on this weekend. So responses should be pretty good in between binge watching something. So that's my plan this weekend. <laughs> Must be nice, Amy. Hey, I, it has been a long semester for me too. So I am very much looking forward. No, actually I'm proofreading the final. The final is done, but now I need to go through and make sure that like 
the right there, there, there is used, or I saw one question where I put a quotation mark instead of apostrophe, so I have to go through every single question and check punctuation and stuff. So that's not as fun, but at least there'll be TV on in the background. <laughs> Me and my daughter are watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and she is laughing hysterically at the 90s stuff. So <laughs> can you go a little bit? I don't think the final's that bad. But then again, I thought the last exam wasn't that bad either. Um, so I, I'm not sure. But I know that you guys have a rough week with peds and OB. Um, but it's still better than last semester when you had like four ATIs and all that stuff. So it could always be worse. Um, but yeah, think nursing process, guys. If you're looking like at COPD, look at all that stuff. And then, you know, if you really want to go out there, what are some good questions? Think about the kinds of questions we've asked you all semester. They're primarily about safety, interventions, understanding teaching. You know, I'm not going to ask you what happens within COPD. That's patho. We're past that. I'm going to say, how are we treating it? What are you looking for? So I'll get this posted at some point today. Yesterday, YouTube took like four hours to upload the review from yesterday, and I have no idea why. So I don't know what was going on, but it's up there. So um, are there ATI? The, the final is a combination of test questions that were written by Dr. Greg, Dr. Greg's questions that we modified. ATI questions and ATI questions that we modified. So if I didn't like some of the wording or stuff, Professor Tucker didn't like it, um, we changed it. So that's what I mean by modified. Or it was like, oh, this could really be two answers. And we changed it. So some of them are, I hope that you look at them and you're like, oh yeah, I like this, it's easy. And then some of them will make you think. It's a good mix. Um, there are select all that apply, which are seem to be the bane of your guys' existence. I would recommend, somebody asked me this yesterday, you guys have access to those dynamic quizzes. Create your own and do practice questions and read those rationales. You truly learn a lot about why it's why that thought process is wrong. Um, or you just weren't, there's something that might be a little bit better. Remember ABCs, safety, threat to life. That's always going to be your priority. Um, yeah. but if, especially if there's a system that you don't feel comfortable on, create your own dynamic quizzes and then go back and see where it went wrong. And then don't forget you have your ATI assignment that is due Sunday. I hope to get caught up on grading this week too, because you guys got a couple of assignments I gotta finish up. So other than that, that's all I have. Well, thank you. We'll probably You're see you. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or any needs that you're gonna have. Like I said, I'll be around this weekend. So all right. Thanks again. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Thank you, Amy.